Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, my name is Zach Khan, and I'm here to talk to you about customer obsession and what does it mean? So just a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I'm currently a senior product manager at Lime uh, based in San Francisco. I joined Lime about two and a half years ago in our product operations group, but then transitioned internally to product manager uh, just over a year and a half ago now. Before Lime, I worked at Facebook for over two years where I was in the operations group. Uh, even before that, I was doing my MBA at Wharton. And then way back when, earlier in my career, I started off in nonprofit consulting. I did strategy work at Groupon and then also did work for Akiva.org and microfinance in both South America and the United States. So that's a quick bit about me. Now let's dive into the content. So the agenda for today in this uh, talk is as follows. Number one, defining customer obsession. Second, the qualities of a customer test PM. What are these? What should we look out for? What should we develop? And then the third, tactics for building the customer obsession muscle. And I'll talk more about that towards the end. The key takeaways I want you all to have from this uh, talk is the following. Flexible definition. Customer obsession uh, could mean a lot of different things to different PMs, to different companies. There's no right answer. Number two, there's not a single quality that defines a product manager who is customer obsessed. PMs can exhibit multiple behaviors, multiple skills to demonstrate their hyper-focus on the customer. And then lastly, customer obsession is a muscle that you build over time. It's not something you either have or you don't have. It's something you can learn, something you can practice. And there are many tactics to be done to develop this mindset. So customer obsession, what does it mean? Well, there's a lot of ways you could frame customer obsession. If you just Google it, you'll get a lot of uh, hits, a lot of different ideas. But I think um, it really all um, came into focus um, with Amazon's leadership principles. And this is kind of what made the term uh, uh, more well known. So Amazon has their leadership principles, customer obsession being one of them. Uh, this principle says leaders start with the customer and work backwards. They work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. And although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers. Start with the customer and work backwards. Makes sense. Working vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. Trust is important. Trust busting is bad. You need to have the trust of your customers and not lose them. And then competitors are important. Obsess over customers. So at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're obsessing over customers. Uh, a top article I found about customer obsession uh, provided a little more uh, clarity and nuance to what customer obsession is. And I like this a little better, but customer obsession describes organizations that continuously add value to the customer experience. These companies collect feedback regularly and prioritize customer needs in every business goal. And they're more concerned with retaining and delighting existing customers than acquiring new ones. I definitely agree with the first two here. Um, these are obvious qualities, but on the third, um, saying we're more concerned with retaining and delighting existing customers and acquiring new ones, that definitely depends on the stage of your business. At Lime, we are a hyper growth company. Retention and delight of existing customers is extremely, extremely important, but we're in growth mode. We need to grow, we need to acquire new customers. So you can't just focus on one thing such as retention. So taking it together, my quick high level thoughts, Customer obsession is not just about obsessing over the customer and product development. Um, there are other folks in the organization who should be obsessing over the customers. A customer obsessed culture is very important at your company um, to really have that focus on the customer, rely on feedback and really own, uh, own the problems and be accountable to what goes well and what does not go well with your customer. After launching a product, um, what you do after is what really matters with customer obsession. You might take all the quantitative and qualitative feedback you have to build out one of the greatest products ever. But after you launch it, something's gonna go wrong. Something's not gonna be perfect. You're gonna notice problems in the metrics, problems in the feedback, and you're gonna to wanna to optimize. You're gonna to wanna to address it. So what you do after the launch is what really matters. And then customer obsession, yes, it does help keep and retain customers. Um, if you are having bad experiences, if you are doing things that are not in the best interest of the customer, uh, you're gonna lose customers. You're gonna break their trust. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about some of these examples later on. So what is a customer obsessed product manager? 
We've all seen it. We've seen the LinkedIn headlines that say user obsessed product manager, customer obsessed product manager, hyper focused on the customer and product manager. You know, you get the drift. Um, all PMs are supposed to be customer obsessed, but customer obsessed, uh, being obsessed is just defining, you know, it's just a summing up different things that we do as product managers and skills that we are supposed to have to be successful. So three key behaviors I like to say for the customer obsessed product manager. Number one, nail the details. The details matter when it comes to your product. The details matter. Number two, seek customer feedback. Might seem like a no-brainer, but um, it's not. You need to set aside time regularly to seek customer feedback, um, whether you're proactively looking for it or you know maybe it's coming to you from other channels. Um, seeking customer feedback, being proactive as a PM is essential. And then lastly, when in doubt, do what's best for the customer. There are going to be times in your business and in your product strategy, you have to assess the trade-offs of doing something that is going to be better for your business um, at like a tangible metric level, whether cash flow, or revenue, or whatever, what have you, profit. But ultimately, you might really need to be doing what's best for the customer with the sacrifice of some of those metrics. And that, in the long run, will help you by having this hyper-focus on the customer, taking their best interests into account when making these trade-off decisions. So nail the details. What is an example of this? This is something we talk about at Lime all the time in our user experience um, and you know, figuring out where there are problems, how to make them better, et cetera. So um, here, this is an example of a screen when you take a scooter ride with Lime and you want to end your trip, right? So Lime, we're an on-demand micromobility rental service. You can rent a scooter, you can rent a bike, you can rent a moped uh, by scanning a QR code. Uh, when you're done with your trip, you press end ride. And then you used to see this UI. We can temporarily lock the vehicle while you grab a coffee. You can keep your ride and resume later. So if you want to pause your ride while you grab a coffee, you can resume it later. Great, this is free, right? Wrong. This costs money. We charge riders for the time they pause it. Well, why don't we just say it? Well, this was a detail we missed. And we went back, we fixed it. We updated the UI to explicitly call out the pricing for the pause per minute rate. And um, we've seen, seen less, um, excuse me, less customer complaints about this confusion and pricing around pause. It's little things like this that matter. It's, it's copy, it's UI design, it's button placement, it's all that good stuff. But really, this is obvious. Copy needs to be clear, copy needs to be transparent, set appropriate expectations for your customer. The details matter. So seeking feedback. Um, if you want to proactively seek feedback from your customer, um, there's really easy ways to do this. You have to dedicate time to preparing for it and also then um, speaking with your customer. But uh, I like to do these uh, feedback sessions generally once a month, once a quarter. Uh, I'll select a random group of uh, riders from Lime um, who meet a certain criteria I'm looking to assess and just send a quick email, uh, introducing myself, offering a really quick phone call in exchange for a nice quick reward. Um, obviously it costs money to incentivize uh, your customers to speak with you sometimes, and then offering up a calendar link. Might seem like a no-brainer, might seem basic, but just to lay it out for you, a uh, simple thing you can do to get signups from your customers to speak with you. And then when in doubt, do what's best for your customer, aka as uh, a former Amazon product leader at my company said, no trust busters. We cannot break the trust of our customers. If we do, that's it, we're done. So when in doubt, do what's best for the customer. Well, what is an example of this? So at Lime, we offer a feature called Lime Cash. You can preload funds into your Lime Cash wallet that you can later use to take a ride with a Lime vehicle. Here's the UI for the Lime Cash. See, you can add different fund amount. Um, we have this auto reload feature to top up after so you go below a certain amount. And then, you know, of course, you tap add funds, you add funds. So what do you notice different between these two screens? They're almost the same. Well. What was going on? So in the left-hand side screen, auto reload was default on for new users. So unless you opted out, we would top up your balance when your balance hit zero. This is not good for the customer. When in doubt, we need to do what's best for them, which entailed making auto reload opt in, not opt out. And this is something um, we saw good results from and really just could, at the end of the day, feel better about yourselves as a company. You're not trying to sneakily um, with dark UX patterns, uh, you know, take more money from customers than they want to give you. 
It's not what we were trying to do at Lime, just a general practice that I was just referring to. Okay, cool. Lastly, build the muscle. How do you build the customer obsession muscle and become a great product manager? Well, you start by working out. I just like this gif of the banana and the broccoli, building their muscles. Uh, probably not customer obsession muscles, but you get the point. So what are some simple tactics for improving your muscle, building the muscle of customer obsession? Again, might seem basic, but I just wanna spell it out. Read customer reviews. So for a consumer app like Lime, this means looking in the app store, looking in the play store, um, and doing this on a regular basis, discussing with the team, calling out issues, et cetera. Number two, read and if possible, respond to customer support tickets. It doesn't hurt to spend like, you know, even 10 minutes a day, just sorting through the most recent tickets, reading what's going on with the customers, seeing what's going on out there. Or if you're owner of a certain product, just searching keywords in your customer support ticket related to that product and reading a couple of those, seeing what's like, uh, spend some time in your customer shoes and get to understand their mindset. And then lastly, uh, this is more of a mantra, but I'll get into why it's a tactic at the end. Nothing is someone else's problem. For a customer obsessed culture, a company needs to adopt this mantra. Nothing is someone else's problem. Just because you don't own it, doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get it fixed because it's in the best interest of your business if you fix the problems that your customers are facing. So customer reviews. Um, at Lime, um, the product managers and the engineers, we read them weekly. Uh, and we do actually even try to respond to them through um, you know, customer support integration with Zendesk. Um, reading the customer reviews are eye-opening. You know, reading the five stars is great. It's a nice pat on your back, but read the one-star reviews. They, they can hurt. It doesn't feel good always reading them, but it also, to me, it inspires me to want to do better, to want to fix things, and to want to always build a great experience for our writers. So here's a fun one I read recently. Um, just first sentence says it all. I don't know what 15-year-old made this app, but it's slow, not user-friendly, and sometimes doesn't work at all. And then this person goes on to talk about some other things that we don't even think might be actionable, but yet, uh, you know, it's in, our, it's in our Play Store review and we, we just have to deal with it. So, you know, we talk about this, we talked about this in our weekly um, product and engineering planning meeting. And um, while, while it is, you know, facetious to read, um, it does highlight problems with like latency in our app, big problem. And we're really gonna work to fix it. So something that just validates uh, our priorities for the quarter um, when we see these things in the reviews and what we've been prioritizing. And then building a culture of customer obsession. Uh, I alluded to this, um, that second um, you know, uh, slide on definitions, which was from HubSpot, kind of alluded to this as well, that it's at the, you know, the company level overall. It's about building the culture company-wide. This is a mantra. Um, I actually learned it at Facebook um, where, you know, where I worked previously, but it's generalized anywhere. Nothing is somebody else's problem. What does that mean? So what does that mean? It means if you see something off, maybe some metrics or a customer review or a customer support ticket, or you read something in the news and you might not be the product owner, you're not the product manager for that feature, or it's not even in the products department, flag it, find the right person whose area pertains to, because maybe it's urgent. Maybe there's a problem that can be fixed easily. And this, and then the, and the owner of whatever the issue is doesn't know about it. The person on the other side, your, your coworkers will appreciate this um, because you are seeking to improve the business overall by just making sure the customer is always happy. And this helps build this customer obsession culture. So nothing is somebody else's problem. I really love this mantra. Uh, and I, I take it with me, um, you know, every day to work when I look at metrics and, and, and read, um, you know, updates and things like that. Okay, so that's all I got. Just to sum up the key takeaways, customer obsession, the definition is flexible. It means different things to different PMs and companies. There is no single definition of customer obsession, just like there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. Um, product managers who are customer obsessed don't exhibit a single quality. There's multiple behaviors, multiple behaviors to demonstrate your hyper-focus on the customer. You know, and then lastly, it's a muscle you build over time. Um, there's skills you use, tactics you use to get better and better. Uh, developing that customer obsession mindset and becoming an all-star product manager to build delightful products for all of your customers. So anyways, that is all I got. Um, if you wanna contact me, ask me more questions, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, but um, yeah, it's been really great talking with you. Thank you, Product School. Um, thanks for listening and um, you know, have a great day, have a great week. Thank you, bye-bye.